Uh, well, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are in the world. So welcome to another Agile Expertise Meetup. Um, and obviously joined here as ever with my partner in crime, Chatao. Hey, Chatao. Hi, everyone. It's good to see you all. Yeah, good to see everybody. Right. And uh, today um, we're super excited because um, we have somebody who was a, a bit of a rock star at the Agile 20 Reflect Festival, uh, who was not only involved in the uh, opening ceremony, uh, but also actually had um, some uh, amazing interaction with uh, their uh, talk, um, which I suppose is, is, is possibly, we could say, a two part talk. The, the, the first one with yourself, Cliff, and then the follow up one, which we also have in two weeks with Lisa. Um, and, you know, without further ado, Cliff, can I hand the baton over to you uh, and obviously um, let the world obviously know who you are and um, start uh, this evening's talk? Certainly. Thank you, Giles. And thank you, Chitao. Uh, it, it's a, a pleasure to give this talk again. Uh, we, we gave it at Agile 20 Reflect, which was like an incredible conference that was just you know, uh, hats off to the, uh, the people who organized that. Uh, the, the talk is, you know, as Giles said, really two parts uh, because the topic is kind of big. It's like all of Agile. <laughs> so, um, so one part is like why we're doing what we're doing and I'll explain that. And the other part is like, well, here's what it is. Uh, and I'll, I'll give a little hint about what it is in, in this talk, but we call it Agile 2. And I want to make it very clear at the beginning that we're not trying to replace Agile. This is not a new manifesto or something like that. What we're saying is some things need to be revisited a little bit and fine tuned and added to. Um, we need to, you know, kind of explicitly learn and make some adjustments. And so Agile 2 is a set of proposed adjustments. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll get into that, um, but really today's talk is about making the case for why we need to do some adjusting and pivoting. And I also wanna say right off the bat that there's nothing new here fundamentally. Uh, these, these ideas that are in Agile 2 are things that uh, people are doing. You know, there's no framework here. This, these are practices and ideas and approaches and ways of looking at it that people who have great success with Agile, this is how they tend to look at it. We find great consistency in, in viewpoints when you, when you see organizations and, and people who have success with Agile and DevOps too, because you really can't separate the two. And product design, you can't separate that either. <laughs> it all works together. So let me start. Uh, the first thing is a uh, challenge. I need to make sure I can share my screen and point it to uh, the uh, slide deck, which I uh, set up as a PDF instead of a PowerPoint. So let me see if I can do that. You have sharing ability, so that's all good. OK. Um, so share, oh, here we go. So preview, this is the one. Okay, so let me check that, oh, here we go. Let me check that people can actually see that. Can you, I wanna verify you're seeing the right thing. Yeah. It, silent majority, you're seeing that? Yep. Okay, yay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I attended a talk recently and uh, it was like perfect. The, <sighs> Uh, the person introduced the speaker and it was something about like using technology to collaborate remotely and his, his zooms, he couldn't share a screen. <laughs> it wouldn't, didn't work. <laughs> and the whole point of his talk was using technology to collaborate remotely. <laughs> anyway, uh, that was kind of a disaster for him. Poor guy. So, so let's get going. And I do have the chat window open and, you know, I tend not to be able to do two things at once. Uh, you know, I'm not, when I was a teenager, I could, but now I can't really do two things at once. So I'll try to keep an eye on the chat, but um, maybe if, if you could 
if, if you have a question, I'll, I'll try to reserve time at the end for questions, but if you have something Great. you really want to get in, uh, maybe uh, send a message to one of our hosts, um, you know, either Giles or Chital, and, and have them get my attention. You know, they'll, they can just interrupt me. Hey, hey, Cliff, someone has something they'd like to share. <laughs> so, uh, so don't, don't be afraid to interrupt me. Now, in order to talk about this, first we have to ask what Agile is. And there was a, uh, a talk that I saw by Dave Thomas, one of the authors of the Agile Manifesto some time back in which, you know, he, uh, he was very kind of upset that people are, have come up with this word Agile. To him, it's an adjective. An organization wants to be Agile. And that makes sense. You know, that's the goal, to be Agile. But whether he likes it or not, there is also something called Agile with a capital A. That's just the reality. And it's, it's different things to different people. You know, when you say Agile, like the Agile community, or, you know, when you say the Agile community, that's not an adjective. That's a proper noun. And, and so, you know, because the Agile community might not be Agile, I don't know, <laughs> we could debate that. But it's a community and the term agile community, you're talking about that cohort of people. You know, and when you say agile ideas, you're really talking about that set of ideas that tend to be exchanged and adhered to by that community. So there is an agile with a capital A, whether we like it or not. Just like in the 80s, the word Xerox came to be a verb that meant to, to photocopy something, you know, um, even though it's not in the dictionary. So anyway, so what is Agile? The reality is that Agile with a capital A is a whole bunch of stuff. And there's no definition of this anywhere. <clears throat> but it, when people say Agile, they tend to mean this stuff. They're referring usually to the Agile manifesto and the ideas expressed in it. They often are referring to Agile frameworks. Um, they often are referring to Agile practices. And then there's the Agile community. So that's, that's what Agile is. Just, that's just the reality. You know, it's not my word. It's just when people say Agile, in my experience, that's usually what they're talking about, some of this stuff. So if we say we want to, to do a retrospective on Agile, this is what we're looking at. We're trying to, what we're trying to say is, is Agile actually helping us be Agile? Is Agile with a capital A actually helping us be Agile with a little a? That's what we're saying when we're doing a retrospective. And what I found is that, and uh, you know, I, I'm a former developer. And so it turns out this cartoon character on the right comes from some cartoon series that I've never seen, but the daughter of a friend of mine said, oh, I recognize that. So anyway, I'm not trying to refer to that cartoon series, <clears throat> um, but, you know, as a former developer, I stay in touch with, oh, I guess a boss, well, boss baby I know about. <laughs> uh, but as a former developer and as a member of the DevOps community, I, I stay in touch with developers. And I pay very close attention as an agilist and agile coach, I pay very close attention to what developers are saying and what agile coaches are saying and what DevOps people are saying. And I noticed a, quite a divergence and what I found is that Agile coaches, if you ask them like, like how Agile is going, usually they're very sanguine about it. You know, oh, it's, it's come so far and it's so great. Although if you ask them in private and say, what are some of the challenges or problems with Agile? Then you get a pretty different story. They usually do have a lot of things that they're worrying about with regard to Agile. Uh, but if you see the conversations in like uh, LinkedIn and Agile forums, you know, generally, you know, if you say, how is Agile doing? It's usually very positive. But if you ask developers, it tends to be, in my experience, about 50-50. And some of them friggin' hate it. <laughs> and so you wonder, what do they hate? Do they even know what Agile is? You know, because maybe they had uh, a bad scrum team experience or something. So you can probably trace it to some bad experience, which maybe you shouldn't blame Agile for that. But then again, if half of them are having bad experiences, 
something's wrong, you know, either in how we're communicating it or how it's, you know, being educated or, or maybe there's things missing. Maybe it isn't right for them or something, you know, some, but something's not right. And we, as, as members of the Agile community, need to reflect and try and figure out, you know, if there's a problem, what is the problem so we can fix it? And, and then, uh, and I guess this character comes from some cartoon series, but, but uh, you know, I, I've worked with machine learning teams and they, you know, there are two kinds of machine learning in, in reality. There's commodity machine learning where like you go to Google or Amazon or something and, or Azure and you use a, uh, an API that has built in machine learning models like for speech recognition, I've used them myself. Um, and all you need to do that is be a programmer. Anyone can use those. <clears throat> but <clears throat> if you're doing something where you need to build your own machine learning model, like to, to drive a car or, or something sophisticated where you need to create a custom machine learning model, the people who do that have PhDs in mathematics. And um, that's a whole different thing. And a lot of organizations have machine learning teams like that, you know, because uh, like very often banks will have machine learning teams that <clears throat> build models that do different kinds of analysis. And, you know, those people have PhDs and, and they're, they're scientists fundamentally. And if you have a development team that's trying to work with those scientists you know, give us your models. The models aren't coming in a very usable way. <laughs> you know that, and it's gotten a lot better. There's unbelievable amount of tools today for machine learning and setting things up so you can have that flow smoothly. <clears throat> but to set that up, who sets that up? <clears throat> and so, so there's a real challenge in setting that up. <clears throat> and generally, I found that machine learning people tend to think, well, the developers just kind of don't understand how we work, you know, because, you know, we're not trying to, we spend our time fundamentally doing R&D. It's not development. It's really more like R&D. <clears throat> so there's, there's kind of a disconnect too. And, you know, that same pattern tends to apply for any specialized area where you need experts, you know, experts who have deep expertise in something often work very differently than development teams do. And so there's a kind of impedance mismatch. And as, as a, you know, an agile coach is a, a leader. They're a, they're, they're a facilitative leader, which is a form of leadership. And, you know, in order to help the teams interface well, they need to take an interest in how everybody is doing their work so that they can help in conversations, try to bridge the gap, to bridge the chasm. <clears throat> now, why, why do you hear these different things depending on who you talk to? Uh, you know, you know one, one part of the community thinks Agile is fantastic, although if you ask them in private, they have lots of concerns. Another, part, half of them do think it's great, you know, programmers, some of them like it, but some of them absolutely hate it. Well, what the heck is wrong? Um, you know, why that disconnect? And there are a lot of problems. There are. So when, when Agile, when the Agile Manifesto came out, I was 20 years into my career and uh, I was CTO of a, a company I had co-founded years before and uh, we decided to try extreme programming for one project and it went really well. And that was 20 years ago. So I'm not new to this. And I'd like to say that during the 1990s is really when things went haywire. You know, it was during the 1990s, you started to see waterfall left and right. Before that, most projects were not waterfall. Most were not. There were one here and there. I was on one in the in the early 80s, but that was the only one in my entire career, one waterfall project. Um, so, so waterfall was kind of an anomaly until the 90s when kind of PMI really became important. 
And uh, so, so anyway, uh, things kind of went wrong. And so Agile was really a reaction to that. You know, what I call the methodology craze of the 90s. Agile was really kind of like, wait a second, this is nonsense. You know, we have to get back to common sense. And, um, but we need to be paying attention and, and kind of reflecting on how well it's going because there, some things are not going that well. And we can see that by talking to programmers. There was, there was a, uh, a post in, there's a programmer forum called Slashdot. And it's almost, it's mostly programmers who, who go on that forum. And so I like to look at it so I can see what people think. And there was a post the other day about Agile. It, it was 20 years has Agile reached its potential. And Slashdot has a voting mechanism so that the most popular posts rise to the top. So I looked at the top 10 posts. 10 out of 10 were highly negative, 10 out of 10. So that's, that's a red flag, that's an alarm. You know, I, I believe in agile ideas. So I, 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 and I feel like I understand why people are upset. And so, you know, my theory is that, you know, agile ideas are sound, but there are some issues. Um, and the, the reaction of programmers is telling me, yeah, there are issues. So we need to kind of figure out what are those issues. And, and, and so I contend that, um, you know, one of them is that we ended up with a lot of tribalism in our community. Um, you know, we, and, and I'm going to get into this and what, what I mean by that. And we ended up also with a lot of dogma and extremes. And I think everybody's familiar with that. And also there are some incorrect ideas. There are. The Agile Manifesto was not carved by a deity on the top of a mountain. It was written by a bunch of guys on a weekend wrote the values. So we shouldn't expect it to be perfect. Why would it be? And, and it's got huge gaps. It has huge important things that are missing. And, and, and it's okay, you know, we shouldn't expect something to be perfect. That doesn't mean it's not immensely valuable. It is immensely valuable. Um, now, one thing that, that I like to ask agile coaches to get them to kind of, kind of, you know, reflect is, you know, have you sat down with developers and said, forget the frameworks, pretend you never heard of them, what do you think would be a good way of working? How would you do it? You know, if, if you had a team of developers and you had to start from scratch, how would you set things up? Have you had that conversation? You know, I would encourage people to have that conversation because it's probably very eye-opening. Um, what they come up with might not look anything like what we do. And another question, um, and by the way, in the 80s, I was on lots of highly, highly agile projects. I'm not gonna go into it. You know, when people still used common sense before the methodologies took over. And they, those projects did not operate the way today is common for agile projects, but they were, it worked. It really worked. Um, <clears throat> so there might be lots of different ways to do it. You know, we should be kind of open-minded about it. Uh, another question I like to ask is, <clears throat> you know, ha have you reflected on evidence that we get in, in that maybe some of our practices are not that effective? You know, and like one of the big ones for me is like these open plan offices, which for me, I just cannot, cannot focus in that setting. I just cannot. And um, yet, you know, we keep doing it, even though if you Google open plan office, you'll see page after page after page of articles explaining why it's bad and why people can't focus and why, <laughs> why they hate it. And yet the agile community or managers who are trying to make their organizations agile, just keep doing that. They just keep doing that. Why, you know, why, why, you know, we as agile coaches should say, wait, you know, this actually doesn't work. 
Um, it may work for some people, but if you look at groups of people, there's a large percent of people it does not work for. So it's like you've ruined work for all those people. Um, and so the, then the, the hard question is, what do you do? And that's a hard one. I don't have an answer. <laughs> I know it works for me, but not everybody's me. So it's, it's a hard problem. Um, and another question I like to ask is, uh, do you take an interest in other parts of value stream? Now, a lot of agile coaches tend to be very interested in the product design side. And luckily, you know, when agile came out, it kind of really blew up product design. Uh, you know, there, product design had become a very mature field. Uh, there are fantastic approaches for product design that go back to the eighties and, and, and when Agile came along, it, it kind of like, it, you know, there was no answer for how to make product design Agile. So it kind of like got rid of it. <laughs> and suddenly you just had a product owner who magically was supposed to know everything, you know, and then, you know, the, the product has to have this feature and that feature and that feature. Yeah, but, you know, what about design? Oh, we didn't think of that. You know, and fortunately, the Agile community has, you know, in recent years realized that that gap and has been trying to fill that gap. And we have user experience thinking and so on. But really, it, it, it was quite sophisticated in, in the 80s. Um, but there's more to it. You know, there's there's also the delivery side. And, you know, and Agile began, began with extreme programming, which when I was CTO, I, I embraced it as an experiment and it worked well, so we kept doing it. Uh, but actually extreme programming is terrible for me. Most of the techniques, I cannot pair programming. I cannot pair with someone because I like to think things through before I code. I usually diagram and I write pseudo code and then I think it through and then I get, so anyway. So some people pair great and some people don't and that's okay, there's nothing wrong with them. And um, test-driven development, I cannot work that way. I like behavioral-driven development, but test-driven development is about unit tests. I don't work that way. Um, and a lot of people don't, and that's okay. We're not bad. There's nothing wrong with us. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's, it's, I liken it to, in the sciences, there's a dichotomy between experimentalists and theorists. And experimentalists are people, they want to try things and do an experiment and then see what happens and then try and maybe figure it out. Theorists like to sit in the library with equations, you know, and then luckily we have experimentists who actually create experiments to see if the equations are right. But theorists are like Albert Einstein or not everyone's Albert Einstein, but that's the personality type. They, they, they spend their time thinking. And a lot of people, are fundamentally that type. In IT, they tend to be the architects and designers and, and so on. Um, and we need both of those. We need both of those people for a healthy ecosystem. You know, and test-driven development is really a process for the experimentalists. <clears throat> and, and so you can't be dogmatic about this stuff. Uh, and my, my point is that uh, it's important to take an interest in how people are working, even the technical side too. Uh, Agile began with technical roots, with extreme programming, and then we kind of like forgot about the technical stuff. And so what happened is it became DevOps. And th there's a complete, a complete chasm between the Agile community and the DevOps community. Well, why is that? Um, the people who champion DevOps identify as Agilists. But if you talk to Agile coaches, they often don't know about DevOps. And so it's, it's so severe that I created a course specifically for Agile coaches to learn DevOps. Um, <clears throat> so it doesn't mean you have to become a DevOps engineer, but you have to not put blinders on. You have to take an interest if, you know, if, you know, if teams are talking about some technical thing, it's important to ask, you know, can you explain that to me? Maybe after the standup, explain that to me how that works. 
You know, I want to understand that and take an interest because it's important to know the vocabulary and know kind of how it works, even if it doesn't mean you can do it yourself, but you should understand how it works. And you can, you can. You just have to ask and read and, and, and spend a little time on it. Um, it's not rocket science. It, you can understand it. So I would encourage people to, to try to understand the entire, what I like to call, you know, the, there's the delivery, the, the capability delivery stream and the customer facing value stream are two different things. The customer facing value stream is what, how value gets to customers. The capability delivery stream is how the organization continues to add new features to that customer facing value stream. And it's important to understand both of those from end to end at, at, a, at, at a conceptual level. Don't have blinders on, oh, I understand this, I focus on this, or I only focus. Try to, you know, folk, try to have an understanding of product design side and, and the team side and the program side and the, and the deliveries. Try to, try to understand the whole picture um, at, a, at a conceptual level. The, when I mentioned tribalism, this is something that, that happened that, that I don't think anyone intended this. It was a, a, a unintended consequence. But you know, these certifications uh, created these tribes. And uh, you know, certifications can be good. My nephew is a certified financial planner, I think it is, I forget. But he studied for a whole year for that and the test was 16 hours. It was grueling. And, um, you know, so, and I, if I go to the doctor, I would like that doctor to be board certified. <laughs> so, you know, certifications can be really good. You know, they show that you have foundational knowledge, um, but they're not good when we use them as like, ours is the way and the only way. Um, and unfortunately, our community does have, have elements who kind of look at it that way, you know. So, you know, and, there, and there's one kind of bad actor in the community organization that is very competitive and they actually write into, if you become a trainer for them, they actually include in their contract, you're not allowed to train for anyone else, <clears throat> you know. So, um, you know, so that, that kind of, behavior is not agile. Um, we should look at these things as just sets of ideas, as toolkits, as sets of ideas for practices and approaches, not as like us versus them, or this is how everyone should do it. So not everyone looks at it that way, but you know, if you encounter someone who does look at it that way, maybe have a talk with them because it's toxic. Um, what what you know the tribalism does is you know it makes people loyal to certain frameworks you know i i very frequently encounter in discussions where where someone is loyal to scrum and they feel that um, you know and the scrum guide really exacerbates this because it says if you deviate from this it's not scrum and so people who are certified as scrum masters don't want to deviate because they feel that they that then they're being unprofessional. <laughs> they're not being true to their certification. And, and so what's what happened, and I watched this happen um, in the industry, you know, it's the, the frameworks kind of froze agile. You know, instead of agile evolving, um, which you know it should have evolved, a product design should have evolved out of it, which it kind of has. Um, but DevOps didn't, you know, and so DevOps kind of had to happen, you know, and so it became its own thing. And I, you know, I, I blame um, the rigidity of these frameworks to some extent, uh, you know, because, you know, it's like you, you had to do it with the framework and if something didn't fit that framework, well, then there ha that had to be wrong because the framework can't be wrong by definition. <clears throat> so, Frameworks can constrain your thinking. Uh, and so that's something to, to watch out for.
And you know, dogma and extremes are very related to that. Uh, and some of it comes from the Agile Manifesto. The, you know, the Agile Manifesto, uh, I, I uh, read something written by um, uh, Bob uh, Martin recently, not Bob Martin, uh, yeah, the clean code guy. Um, and, you know, he was, he was at one of the authors of the Agile Manifesto and, and he insists that when they came up with the values that they intended for this over that to be a balance, that it wasn't like one is better than the other. It was like, usually this is better, but not always. Sometimes is it, well, sometimes we need a good dose of this other thing too. That was, according to him, that was very much their intention. They actually discussed that for a while. But, but, but you know, I, maybe because extreme programming started out with the premise of being extreme, and you know the original book on extreme programming was extremely dogmatic. Uh, you know, somehow it got interpreted as an extreme, and so like you know the Agile Manifesto says best stuff comes from self-organizing teams. It doesn't say you should always use self-organizing teams. It doesn't say that. It says when stuff goes really well, <laughs> self-organizing teams produce the best stuff. Not all teams can self-organize. Um, my wife's a behavioral therapist. And when I say to her, teams should self-organize, she looks at me like I'm nuts because she deals with people who have emotional problems. <laughs> <clears throat> but um, the thing is, if a, self, if a team can be self-organizing, they, they're, they're rock stars. You know, it's, that's the best situation. But not everyone can. And a lot of times things go wrong and has, someone has to intervene and you have to set them up for success. You know, I, so I view self-organization as an aspiration. It's something you wanna to try to create. It's not something you assume will happen just because that's how it would always happens. It's something you need to curate and very carefully nurture and help people help a team of people mature to the point where where they can run themselves and some groups of people can self-organize right away it depends but a lot can't that's the problem and you know and the same thing is true with autonomy you know you ideally you want teams to be autonomous to a large degree no team's fully autonomous otherwise you don't have an organization you have a bunch of little organizations you know, teams always depend on each other. They cannot make decisions autonomously entirely. But you want to try to get them to a point where they are mostly autonomous, where you don't have to babysit them, where they're making good decisions on their own. And that takes work. It doesn't happen by itself. You have to nurture that. Um, and people sometimes forget that. And so there's a role for leadership in realizing these ideals. The ide these ideals don't happen automatically. You have to make the, these ideals happen. You have to realize them. Um, you know, an another kind of thing that got taken to the extreme was, uh, you know, T-shaped people, which is a very powerful idea because it means no one ever has to wait. You know, I, I don't have to wait for someone else to do something. I know how to do it. You know, that's great, but, a a group of machine learning people, they're not T-shaped, you know, or if, if you need a DevOps expert to come in and show you how to do stuff, that person might not be T-shaped, you know? So, so you know, it, in, in complex products where you have lots of teams and complex infrastructure, you need experts in some way, they're not T-shaped. And so how do you blend them into the team? They need to become either extended team members or they need to act as consultants or there are a lot of different approaches, but you have to figure something out. Not everybody's T-shaped. And let's, oh, and this is another one that is like very challenging for me personally because I read and write better than I talk and listen, you know? And, and so like face-to-face -face is always best. I love face-to-face -face uh, conversation, but not everybody communicates best that way. And, and the thing is with complex issues, you need reading and writing. You actually need five things. You need 
for complex issues, I'm not talking about simple things, for complex multifaceted issues, you need reading, writing, um, talking, listening, and thinking. You need all five of those. And if you don't have all five of those, you're not gonna be able to talk through and, and work through the challenges of really complex issues. Communication is not like a one-time thing. It's a process. It's communication about something complicated is a series of interactions over time. And so people sometimes need to like think on their own for a day and then get back to you. Or they might need to write their thoughts down and share that, you know, because that's how they express themselves better. They can, they can write the whole thing down end to end, whereas in a conversation, they get interrupted, which might shatter their focus or they, you know, so some people need to write down end to end their whole thought process. And then if people need to be willing to read that. You know, today you often hear, I don't have time to read. That's a non-starter. If you're working in a, in, in a field where it's an intellectual field where you're dealing with complex stuff, you have to be willing to read. I mean, otherwise, why'd we learn to read? You know, you have to be, you, and, and you also have to recognize that people communicate differently. Some people communicate better verbally. And if you're a person who likes to read and write, you need to make an effort to, to explain things to people who are natural listeners and talkers. You need to make an effort, not expect them to read everything. But they also have an obligation to try to read everything. You know, it it's, goes both ways. You know, people need to try to, to accommodate those they work with. Um, that's, that's the thing. And people are different. And then, so, so these are kind of extremes that in our community, we, we kind of like rushed to one side of this instead of realizing that it's actually a rich variety of things. Um, oh, and then the team role issue, you know, like where every, like Scrum says, everyone on the team is the same. Well, no, they're not. Um, you know, experience matters. And, you know, that doesn't mean that you should just listen to the highest paid person in the room. What it means is um, you should value people's experience. They, they've been through, they have judgment. You should listen carefully. But then you should also, and this goes for the experienced people, they should listen to, to any concerns anyone has. You know, uh, people shouldn't be ignored just because they're less experienced. A lot of times, less experienced people have innovative ideas. So, um, you know, sometimes you need to like, let the most experienced people like make the final decision, but they need, but they need to be listeners. Uh, they need to be Socratic. Um, they need to be able to have dialectic conversation. Um, so, so that gets into like thought leadership and, you know, kinds of leadership that are inquisitive and not bossing people around. But, you know, if someone has to make a final decision you might defer to someone who's experienced, but that person has an obligation to make sure they're getting everybody's brain. <clears throat> and then if, they, if they're in a position to make a decision, they need to own responsibility for that decision. And another thing where things kind of went wrong, and I mentioned this was, you know, the, the team room. And we, we kind of forgot that um, you know, focus is important, you know, because, you know, the Agile movement was a rejection of, uh, you know, throwing documents over the wall where you would do like absolutely ridiculous things like a consulting company would come up with a requirements document and leave. <laughs> How useful is that? And then, and then, you know, the procurement office would contract out another contract for a company to create a design from the requirements document. And then they'd contract out to the lowest bidder for someone to implement that. <laughs> no programmer in their right mind would do things that way. And of course that didn't work. Um, and so Agile was a rejection of that and saying, hey, look, documents aren't knowledge. You can't just give someone a document and expect them to be able to work from the document. 
not in this field anyway, maybe in, in architect, maybe in building construction, you can do that because we've been doing it for a thousand years or 10,000 years and, you know, buildings are different from software. So, but in our field, that doesn't work. And you need to be able to talk to people and because you can't design it all ahead of time. You know, the design evolves, it gets more refined and you need to have collaboration and not just about the technical, but about what it's supposed to do. And you need to include users. So it's a highly collaborative process. And, and so Agile kind of like said, it was a wake up call. We need to be collaborative, not hand off documents. But what happened is we just focused on collaboration and we forgot that people also need to be able to focus deeply. They need to be able to think deeply. Um, and that really needs to be rethought. Uh, how do we do that? That's a hard problem. Um, you know, and people are different. You know, I, <clears throat> I had a friend in college who, if she was focused on something, we could all be screaming at her, Florence, Florence, Florence. And then finally, after like, if, with Florence, finally she'd go, what? You know, and she was like working on her homework. You know, and she was an extrovert, by the way. Um, but some people like, you know, if like there's a little like, like pipe ticks, like, like that, they look up, what was that, you know? I'm kind of like that. My wife says, you know, any little noise she makes during the night, I wake up and I say, is everything okay? You know, <clears throat> you know, so people are, are different. You know, I, I think, you know, introverts are like cats are introverts and dogs are extroverts. <clears throat> you know, introverts, uh, there's evidence, I don't know how well studied this is, but there's evidence that introverts are more sensitive in general. And so any little disturbance, shatters their train of thought. Ex, you know, extroverts like can have lots of stuff going on and they're fine. So, so people vary, that's the dilemma, you know. Um, <clears throat> so, I'm, you know, I'm not giving an answer here like what should we should do. I haven't given any answers. I'm trying to call attention to some problems. Agile 2 has some ideas about how to maybe we could look at this to maybe find some solutions. But it also doesn't give like tangible answers like practices. It's just maybe kind of a different, maybe like a more mature way to look at it is what Agile 2 proposes. But here today, I'm really only raising problems that we need to solve because it's Agile is worth saving. <laughs> the foundational ideas are powerful and important. Um, but you know, some incorrect ideas have taken root, like the product owner role. You know, you need someone who's responsible and accountable for like what the product does. But somehow that turned into this person like knows what the product should do. Well, they probably don't, you know? And it turned into kind of a feature factory where they're they're like, oh, it should do this and it should do that. And it should, you know, maybe if they're a subject matter expert because you're building an internal product and they've worked in that department for 10 years, then maybe they do know. <clears throat> but if it's like a product that is gonna be used by the public, um, you know, in, in a retail context, th they probably, even if they think they know, they probably really don't. Um, I, I had a, a friend who was a CEO of a startup that um, it was, there was a professor from a university who had some idea and they got several million dollars and they started building this thing. And then they hired my friend as a CEO. And um, he, first thing he did was he did a study, a market study of what people wanted. <clears throat> and they had already been building and spending money for six months. And, you know, he came on, he did the study. It turned out nobody wanted what they were building. <laughs> Luckily, they hired him and they pivoted very rapidly and they did build what people actually did want. But um, you know, the only way you know is by actually like working with real people. And sometimes people don't know what they want. You know, that's the famous, you know, Henry Ford said, if you ask people what they want, they'd say a faster horse. Um, 
So, you know, you have to, you have to try things and you have to find ways that, you know, where users actually can visualize what you're, what you're trying to create and, and, and then have epiphanies, you know, of what they really need um, to empower them. And, and Scrum turned into, and your XP is like guilty of this too, but it turned into this one directional flow of ideas, <clears throat> you know, where like it's assume the business knows and then the tech side is just implementing. That's pathological, you know, a lot of products, product ideas come from the tech side. Um, <laughs> Because, and it's because technology makes new products possible. Um, like um, the iPhone, you know, this technology made that possible. Touch screens and, and uh, you know, uh, the internet is the most obvious example, you know, made all kinds of things possible. <clears throat> you know, so, you know, a lot of times people who understand the technology have really good ideas once they understand what the user tries is trying to do, what their job is. Tech people might say, oh, well, you know, if that's really what they're trying to do, we could do this. And the people on the business side might say, oh, really, we can do that? I never thought of that. Because they're thinking in their current paradigm, you know? So the ideas can flow either way. You can have inspiration either on the business side or the tech side. And so this, this one directional assumption that, uh, that product ideas flow from the product owner and that developers just estimate points, that's pathological. And there's some big things that got left out. Um, you know, product design and the user, who I already mentioned, um, data. Uh, I, most people don't know, but there was an early agile methodology that focused very strongly around data modeling. It was called feature-driven development. <clears throat> um, I was in Singapore working for Jeff DeLuca uh, right before he came up with that. And, and so I, I remember I, I participated with him and Peter Code and David Anderson in all day modeling sessions. And there were three business analysts from the bank, United Overseas Bank. <clears throat> and the whole idea was to transfer their understanding of the organization's data into our heads and to create an object model of this very complex kind of data that they had because the goal was to build a, loan, a new loan origination system. So we had to understand their data. We spent like two months studying their data before we even, even thought about what the software would do. <clears throat> um, and you know, somehow data got left out and there are really three things wrong with, I mean, and there, there are really three problem areas with regard to data. You know, there's understanding the organization's transactional data is one that the teams need to understand. And today it often manifests as microservice APIs. Or, or message schemas, but there's an information model, you know, and it might be a domain-driven design model, <clears throat> but it's just assumed that teams know and they don't, you know. So, so anyway, that's that's like a an area, and 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 there's a, a kind of a a really missed opportunity there because because teams aren't thinking about data, you know. There's also the issue of test data, which they never have good test data. You know, because the business doesn't provide it, which they should, because it's their data, uh, and so you can't really trust what they build. Because, <laughs> but but the real bigger problem is, you know, today, uh, you know, because teams don't really think about data, and because we just like we got rid of product designers for a while, we got rid of data architects because it wasn't agile. And instead of figuring out how to add them in an agile way, we just axed them. And so, so what we have today is we have data lakes that really are data swamps, you know? And, and so machine learning teams can't make heads or tail of all the data in the data lake. And so they can't leverage that data <clears throat> uh, for training models. 
um, or finding insights, BI insights. And, and teams don't know they're doing anything wrong. They're following the agile process. So we, you know, by not saying anything about data, we've, we've really kind of left this huge crater in how we do things. And then the whole area of leadership, um, you know, the Agile Manifesto kind of says two things about leadership. You know, it, 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 you know, it kind of intimates, you know, self-organizing teams kind of implies um, leave us alone, like managers are bad, which that's not true. And self-organizing teams are good, but it doesn't happen by itself usually. And by not, by not saying anything about leadership is like implying that you don't need leadership. And also, you know, trust the team to get the job done. It's like, again, leave us alone, um, which was a reaction to bad project managers. And I had my share of those. They're a nightmare, you know, but you, that doesn't solve a problem. You know, there are bad managers. So, so just saying having no managers, that's not a solution. Okay, there's some bad parents, so no parents. <laughs> All right, some, some, you know, anyway, um, we need to define good leadership models and find ways, you know, to, for organizations to move their culture in those directions. That's what's helpful. Um, it's not easy. It's the hardest thing of all. Leadership is the hard problem. People have written about leadership for thousands of years. We, you know, we still don't have it figured out, but that's, that's where it is. That's the problem to solve is leadership. Um, and Agile has, you know, you know, some really powerful ideas that we need to build on and make these ideas work. We need, you know, the Agile manifesto encouraged like an oversimplified way of looking at this stuff. We need to look deeper. We need to, to think deeply about it. And a lot of people are. Um, it's not, you know, there are a lot of, and like Agile too, you know, we, we wrote a book about it. Uh, a lot of people in the industry are thinking well about this stuff. So, I mean, there's hope. Um, and we need to be open-minded about it, not think, oh, it's just this framework or this methodology. We need to view everything as just a set of ideas and then figure out for ourselves what we think we should be doing for the situation at hand. Um, you, know, you know, I maintain that the Agile Manifesto, which is not perfect, it's, think about it, it's a bunch of guys, all guys, all similar cultural backgrounds, <laughs> but that's another issue. Um, you know, one, uh, one from uh, Northern Europe, uh, a few from UK and all, all the rest from the US. Um, and it's, they came up with the values on a weekend. They were probably drinking. <laughs> so, you know, set your expectations accordingly. But despite that, it's good. It's, it's good. It's not perfect, but it's good. Um, but if you read, if you know the principles, they they bang those out over email later on. It's only the values they came up with all together. The ink, but the the principles, a few of them like went back and forth by email. Um, but um, if you read it literally, you have trouble. You get into trouble. It's if you have to read it with some sophistication. You know that they're not really saying only do this. I mean, there's they're assuming you have judgment about these things. So if you don't have judgment, which implies you have experience, be careful, you know, because um, you have to have judgment to know, uh, you know, this over that. You have to have judgment to really know what, what they're saying and uh, what how to use that idea. Um, you know, like, and then, you know, you know self-organization is, a really valuable paradigm, but it's not simple. Um, conversation and real-time collaboration are important elements, uh, but that's not all there is to it. You know, people also need focus. Um, and another thing about making making interactions real time is today you tend to have organization people who go agile 
suddenly all everyone's calendar is full. And the reason for that is because, uh, well, two things, you know, one is the, um, you know, because now everything is, every issue is cross-functional. So now everybody has to be in everyone's meeting. And so you have to be in three times as many meetings. And the other is the assumption that collaboration has to be face-to-face, -face, you know? And, you know, so what happens is we have all these standing meetings and standing meetings are the problem, standing meetings. Um, and I include stand-ups in that, you know, stand, what, you stand up can be okay, but you should think about it. You know, maybe they don't need stand-ups this month for what they're working on. Maybe they're cooking along and things are stable and maybe you need twice a week, kind of a one hour discussion about stuff. You know, maybe it'd be better if people really kind of focus for a while, you know, so you should be thoughtful about just saying we should have a stand-up every day. Um, but standing meetings in general are very problematic because most standing meetings are just for communication. You know, you get everybody together for, you know, usually among managers. It's like everybody like, these are the latest issues, let's share. Why do you need to get everybody in a room for that? You know, send an email, put it in, a, put it in Teams, put it on a dashboard. You know, a meeting is really, really, really costly. It's nothing more costly in an organization than a meeting. And if, if you use meetings for communication, what happens is no one has time for deep conversations because they're in standing meetings all day. If something comes up, you know, and, and someone wants to really talk it through where you need an hour or two or a few hours, Good luck. You know, when are you going to find that block of time in someone's calendar? Six months out. One of the best managers I've met in recent years, he called me on a Friday. He used to not go to most standing meetings. And I was, I was at home because this client was out of town and this was before COVID. And he, he, I got a, a text message. I think it was a text. Anyway, he contacted me on a Friday and he said, can you get on Zoom right away? I'm talking to someone else. I want to talk to both of you. We talked for two hours because he wanted to, you know, he'd been looking at, at this product area for a while and he, he wanted to really talk it through and really understand. A meeting should, the purpose of a meeting should be to achieve understanding and then maybe, maybe, move to consensus and then a decision if you're ready. But you know, it should be achieve understanding. Now, Jeff Bezos said that recently, actually. He tries to have three good meetings a day. Um, whereas we use meetings for getting updates, which is a really, really bad use of people's time. But in order to change that, you have to change the culture of the organization. The leadership needs to take that on. They need to make people realize that the leadership expects communication to be asynchronous and broadcast or dashboards, some mechanism like that, and that people are expected to stay up to date. That'd be like, if you're not up to date on the right information, it'd be just like being late for work. It's frowned on. They need to get that message. Um, so there's a cultural uh, thing, element to that. And then use standing meetings for when and not standing meetings, use meetings when you need to, when an issue comes up, schedule it right away. And guess what? You can now because calendars are freed up. <laughs> so you can now, now you can schedule a two hour meeting on short notice because most can't, not, you don't want to cancel all standing meetings. Some standing meetings are good for maintaining a relationship, someone maybe, but most standing meetings aren't necessary. So we need to think, rethink stuff. Um, you know, other things that are really good about Agile, dividing work in the small increments, continual reflection is my favorite Agile practice, retrospective. But we need, to, we need to think of the whole value stream and whole delivery stream and not just focus on one part of it. Telling it like it is, that's a cultural thing. Um, you know, the organization needs to, people need to feel safe. Uh, I'm a big believer in leaders going into Teams channels or Slack channels and saying, what do you think? 
And then a few brave people will say, I think this. And then if the leader shows them that that's safe by saying that's a great idea or, huh, I'll have to think about that if they don't agree, you know, people will see it's safe. And, and then they'll start to do that more. Um, it ha that has to be demonstrated by leadership. And agile is essential. You know, sometimes like if you talk to DevOps people, they think agile is superfluous. Well, they don't know what they're talking about in that regard. Um, you know, agile has become about the people side of the equation. It's absolutely, it's more important than the technical side, <laughs> the people side. Um, but ironically, you know, paradoxically, the people side needs to pay attention to the technical side, even though the people side is more important. And, um, you know, ag Agile, you know, needs to kind of pivot to, to solidify itself, I think. And, and that's, anyway, that's what Agile 2 is about. So Agile 2 is a, a set of ideas and it's, it's not like a manifesto. It's not five like values or something. It's agile, the way we did Agile 2 is we got 15 people together with diverse background, product design, leadership, um, engineering, uh, um, human resources, um, business, uh, DevOps and Agile, of course, uh, learning theory. You know, we, we got people together with a lot of diverse experience from different parts of the globe too, by the way. And we first did a retrospective, you know, what are the problems, basically these things. And then what do we think? What have we seen work? You know, where we see this actually work well, what are people doing? And what, what do we think people should do? And we came up with what we called a set of problems and a set of insights. And then we rolled those up into a set of principles. And we got that down to 43 principles. <laughs> so it's non-trivial because this is a hard problem. It's, it's not simple. This is not simple stuff. And we include, you know, unlike the manifesto, which just has its principles and values, we included all the problems and insights that are behind our thinking that resulted in our principles. And then we published that. And then we wrote a book to explain because no one wants to sit and read 43 principles on a website. I'm sorry, I wouldn't. Would you? You know, I wouldn't sit and read 43 principles on, but, you know, but the book is written to be um, readable. Uh, it's not a textbook. It's not a, like a technical book or something. It's really talks about this kind of stuff and, and, and some ways of looking at these issues to help find solutions. It has a lot of examples. Um, and so Lisa Cooney will get into it uh, a little bit next time. And you know, just in closing, I'd like to emphasize, it's just a set of ideas. It's not a framework. It's not a manifesto. It's not a methodology. It's by definition, not complete because you cannot write a complete treatise on human issues. It's just a set of ideas. It doesn't replace anything. It doesn't replace the manifesto. The manifesto is great. It's got issues, but it's still great. <laughs> um, you know, there, and it doesn't like replace lean or it embraces, embraces all these different sets of ideas and just says, use all these to create your own mental model. You know, this is our offering. That's the perspective from which it was written. Thank you. Wow, Cliff, I, I just got to say, I've been sat uh, enjoying the, the, the conversation and, 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 and the chat has also been on fire talking about all of this. Look at this, um, shocks going around putting the love hearts on. I mean, a, a <laughs> phenomenal, it's brilliant. Um, uh, thank you ever so much. And, and genuinely, uh, it should tell myself, I've, I've just quietly behind the scenes been saying, uh, we need to have you back again uh, at some point in the year, um, you know, for one of our other events. 
um, uh, because it's, it's this type of learning, this type of thought leadership that people need to get exposure to. Um, and listening to the passion, you know, and I, I suppose it's also the heritage, the history, the journey that y- you've been on and the fact that it, it's still ongoing, it's, it's not going to end, um, f- from my perspective, has, has been, you know, uh, amazing. Uh, and, you know, just thank you very much indeed for, you know, sharing this with us. And obviously we've got, uh, you know, five, ten minutes or so for questions. I know Chatel's got some uh, questions or points she would like to make at some point as well. But if I, I do want to open it up. If anybody does have some for, for Cliff, and even if Chatel, you want to come in, look at that, one of the best talks, thanks from Aninda, brilliant. Um, uh, please do, um, you know, over to uh, our amazing community here. Yeah, um, Cliff, thank you so much. Actually, before I ask my questions, I'm actually going to pull it out to the room. So um, those of you who were on the chat, please, please, please come forward right now and uh, ask your questions. Shoka. Shoka. Hi, yeah, thanks very much. Excellent and great talk, uh, Cliff. I'm just wondering, so in my mind, there was an underlying theme all the way through your talk and presentation. And that was about people and behaviors. So the norm in terms of human beings. And so, so the leadership thing, I feel that you, you brought it in at the end, whereas that is an aspect that touches everything that you were talking about, because it's about people. And, and I, I'm wondering, was that deliberate? Because um, yeah, I, th- I think it's a really potent thing. And that was what was sort of humming in my head. And then at the end, you come, you laid it down there and said, look, there's a big factor in terms of leadership. Because um, just to close, because I mean, that's a challenge we have within the community. Uh, leadership actually to, to, to change and influence people to change starts with yourself. And I'm not sure that um, there's a comfortable framework the community has. And, and I don't think it should have one, but there's a behavior and a mindset that should be there. So that's, that's the context of my question. Thank you. Leadership is what it's all about. And unfortunately, when people hear the term leadership, they think boss. Uh, But leadership is a complex subject. Uh, On the Agile 2 website, we actually posted our own leadership taxonomy because we couldn't find one. I mean, there's been a lot written about uh, management theory and, and different types of leadership, but there doesn't seem to be an accepted like breakdown um, so we created one uh, by combining ideas from a lot of different sources. And leadership, you know, has a direction, it can be, in, you know, focused on one's team or it can be focused outward at the rest of the organization or the public or whatever the context is. And it also takes many forms. Uh, you know, we, Agilists, we're all familiar with servant leadership, which actually has several varieties. Um, I, if you read Greenleaf's original paper about servant leadership, he makes it very clear that it is leadership. It's, he says people will follow the servant leader. Yep. Um, but you know, when people talk about in the Agile community about servant leadership, they emphasize the kind of helping aspect of it, which is an important element of it. And so those are two kind of variants of the model. And there's also, uh, you know, the idea of thought leadership, which has variants too. You know, there's a a person often is considered a thought leader if they are a fountain of good ideas, but you can also be a thought leader in the sense of making sure that good ideas get heard. Like a good example is, I feel that if a team has a tech lead, the tech lead shouldn't be dictating, we're gonna do this, everything this way and that way, they should be starting conversations and say, you know, I'm thinking we should design it this way, what do you think? And maybe maybe their leadership role requires them to make a decision about it, but they should be open-minded about it. Or maybe they operate by consensus, Uh, you know, so it depends. So, you know, thought leadership is something that's really important when you're creating complex things. And it doesn't have to all come from one person. It can be emergent or there, there can be, and or there can be as an explicit role. Um, you know, and, and then there's, uh, you know, inspirational leadership. Um, 
who was a Peter Drucker, I think, used to say that you need an inside person, an outside person, and a person to get things done. And, you know, the outside person is the one who's kind of like the face of the group, you know, because, you know, someone has to deal with the outside world to advocate for the, the team or the organization, whatever it is, to, to represent them in a positive way, to get resources, and, and, and also to make commitments. Um, you know, the real world expects commitments. That's how you negotiate. And so a, a leader who represents an entity needs to be able to make certain commitments, which implies they have some level of authority. And the, the Agile community often has trouble with that idea that someone has to have authority, but authority is necessary in many situations. You have to have authority if you're spending other people's money or, or hiring and firing people. You know, the, the thing is about authority is just because you have it doesn't mean you should always use it. Yeah. Um, in fact, most of the time you shouldn't be using it. You should reserve it for when you really need it. Um, but, you know, that's, you know, a, an aspect of leadership. Not all leadership carries authority. Um, you know, and then there's, you know, a really important one that gets overlooked often is, is uh, an inquisitive leadership where, where someone is, is, is saying, are we missing anything? Or what should we do about this problem? What do you think? And making sure that discussions happen and that decisions are actually reached and that the discussions include everybody, not just the vocal people, but that you're getting everybody's brain. So there's a kind of like Socratic uh, or, or dialectic leadership you know, depending on your style and in getting people to contribute, you know, so, so leadership takes many different forms. Um, and leadership is really what it's all about. It, if, if you have, if you have an initiative that has a framework and bad leadership, it won't work. You'll still have bad results. If you have no framework, and no plan, but you have good leadership, it will work <laughs> because yeah. every, the, the, everyone, you will all figure it out. You know, you, because a good leadership, a good leader is empowering. They say, what do you think we should do? And, and they, you know, they help other people to assume leadership roles who are the right people. And, and they promote autonomy. And, <laughs> but they, they do it in a, in a careful way, a thoughtful way. So um, leadership is the core is the core issue. I think I think you need you need that kind of influence uh, from a good leader that allows the autonomy, allows the decentralization of decision making. Um, so we have it. We have a question from Aninda. Uh, Aninda, did I pronounce your name correctly? Correct, by the way. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Off you go. Yeah. Uh, my question is actually this was a topic that. The other day, it was making rounds on LinkedIn, and I was engaging with it. And it was about why people sometimes don't share information uh, with other people. And the discussion was going on. It could be related to power, greed, I don't know, selfishness. It could, it just, the discussion just kept, it could be maybe psychological safety stuff. And then uh, the question is, is uh, when this kind of traits we see in, a, in an organization where people are not sharing information and, you know, people are keeping things to themselves for whatever reason. Uh, is it a system problem? Again, we, we come back, I, I guess we'll come back to the leadership topic again. It is a system problem or is it a people problem? So is it that person, those individuals who are just like that and that, that's why we face this issue? Or is it is, is the problem at the core of the organization itself or is it both? Well, it's... Ultimately, it's always a people problem, but I, I don't mean that in the sense of like blaming the individuals. I mean, uh, you know, people sometimes have agendas. They, they do. You know, if you have a group of people, especially once you get into management levels, um, they have private agendas. Uh, and uh, you know, to a large extent, you know, it's because of a zero sum situation that maybe the organization has created so that then it could be a system issue. Uh, but even if you eliminate that, people still have agendas. I mean, there, there have been studies 
I have numerous articles of people who, you know, relay that, um, you know, in organizations that have very little structure, it's actually worse because you end up with, with private power structure. I mean, with you, you end up with non-explicit power structures. You know, what, what happens is people form relationships and they have private conversations and all kinds of stuff's happening behind the scenes and, and, and certain people are getting, you know, more work or whatever than others and no one knows why and, you know, it's weird stuff. And, I mean, interestingly, if you look at writing about management theory from like 80 years ago, um, organization hierarchy was devised as a, a solution to the kind of anarchy of like organizations that were run like fiefdoms where there wasn't any structure, you know, where it was like a lot of nepotism and so on. Um, so, you know, structure was seen as a solution, which is interesting because the agile man, the, you know, the agile community sees structure as the problem, but, you know, it's, it's not that, you know, structure's good or bad, you know, it's, you, you, you have to have the right culture of leadership. Um, uh, you know, the culture eats strategy for breakfast. You, you have to have the right people. And that means having a culture of recognizing and empowering people who demonstrate the right forms of leadership. You know, you, you want, you know, like look at a team, you want someone who like, like takes it upon themselves to help others and to solve problems and to get things organized, you know, and that might not be the person who looks like a leader. That might be someone who's kind of quiet. And if, they, if you say, who wants to lead this team? They won't raise their hand, you know, but, you know, you need to identify those people. A lot of times the person who looks like a leader is not the best leader. And, but the person who looks like the leader is the person who tends to emerge when you don't have structure. Um, so, uh, so it's, it's a hard problem. You know, even if you, you know, you have a group of people, some will have agendas uh, and it's not necessarily bad. It can be bad, but you know, uh, I've had a couple of nightmare experiences with, with people on, in a group having personal agendas. I don't want to get into it, but um, you know, the assumption that if you just like facilitate and talk it through that you can solve that, it's not always true, you know, because if, if people have different values or, or conflicting agendas, you cannot resolve that. You cannot, you have to, you have to either uh, insert control into the situation or remove someone. Um, that's the only way to resolve it. Um, a good example <laughs> is when, when I got divorced, you know, my wife and I were forced into mediation, but it was unresolvable. So it went to court. <laughs> you cannot always resolve things by having a, someone facilitate a discussion and saying, let's work it out. It might not resolve it. Um, so I would, I would say it really, it really boils down to, uh, you know, having the right uh, culture of encouraging and recognizing the right behavioral behavioral norms and right leadership behavior norms across the organization. Yeah. Great. Fantastic. Well, look, Thanks. as we begin to wrap up, we are on the hour. It's uh, here in the, the uh, UK. It's now uh, 8 uh, p.m. GMT. Um, uh, before I do my wrap up and my uh, Word of thanks to Cliff. I'm just going to hand over to Chatel. Chatel has something she just wanted to add. So, Chatel. So, Cliff, uh, I just wanted to say thank you so much um, for, you know, presenting the talk where I'm just like nodding pretty much all the way through. Um, I think we really, really resonate. And actually, just to kind of echo uh, the conversation that was just had, people are complex. You can't predict how people are going to respond to. 
um, even the push of agile ways of working. And not only that, I think what was really valuable and I really, I really appreciated your pragmatic approach in that you're saying that, well, the manifesto was designed by developers. Now, I do have a biased opinion in that I think the best agile coaches are developers, um, but that's just my opinion. Um, but ultimately they have missed the customer. They have, they, they said the customer is, uh, you know, you have to satisfy the customer, but the poor product owner, you're right, doesn't know everything. You know, they do still need to go out to the market and speak to the customers. And this is a little bit of a mind blowing um, thought process for many organizations. And I think it's something that we should really push on in terms of an agenda. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you so much because I just felt myself going, yes, agreed, 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 agreed. And on that note, based on what Giles was saying, we totally would love to have you back and try and get you a wider audience because you've got so much wisdom to share and we'd, we'd love that if you could. Yeah. Thanks, I'd be happy to. And it was a great pleasure. Thank you. I Brilliant. Enjoyed. Well, Cliff, uh, obviously, on behalf of uh, uh, Agile Expertise and Chatel myself and the community that we, you know, we, we love and support here um, uh, every time we put one of these on, uh, major appreciation. Thank you for, I suppose, the empathy, the the emotional intelligence and emotional quotient you you brought to the talk today, um, which um, again, I just I just felt it was you know very engaging. And uh, we look forward to obviously part two, shall we say chapter two of this talk uh, in a couple of weeks with Lisa. Uh, and I'm already looking forward to seeing uh, what we learn from that. Um, I don't know if you'll be with us then or not, but uh, hopefully um, we will have you back at our community. And um, again, major appreciation, Cliff. Thank you very much from everyone here. Thank you very much for myself. Thank you very much from Chatel. And thanks everyone for coming. And we look forward to hopefully seeing you all in a couple of weeks' time. Thanks, everyone. See you soon. Cheers, guys. Thanks very much. Bye.